Right, uh, so I would like to present today some ideas that I came across while doing my PhD research precisely here at this university. Not necessarily on the role of taxpayer rights, but um, I just realized that they are very much relevant in the context of anti-money laundering framework and increasing scope to which tax matters are being included in it. So the title of my presentation is the increasing processing of taxpayer related information in the preventive AML CFT framework and possible effects of this development on tax transparency. So since most of us, most of you are specializing uh, in the area of taxation, I would like to give a brief uh, historical overview on how tax matters have been included in the international standard uh, that concerns anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing. Then I will proceed with discussing what practical results this might have on the financial institution information gathering about the um, account holders. And finally, I would like to conclude with highlighting some key areas which, in my opinion, will pose concerns as to the adequate uh, processing of the uh, taxpayer-related information. So if we think about Panama, Bahamas, or any other uh, less recent leaks, uh, they have spurred investigations in a number of issues uh, is it tax crime, money laundering, or simply international tax system abuse? Uh, we can derive from that that, of course, these two issues are very closely related, and tax transparency probably cannot be discussed without taking into account financial uh, transparency framework. However, uh, it is important to note that in 1994, the Financial Action Task Force, a standard setting body in the area of anti-money laundering standard, has specifically stated that while the laundering of drugs money will remain a principal focus for FATF, its work will continue to cover money laundering of the proceeds of serious crimes and or offenses which generate significant funds. However, as in the past, the FATF will not deal with tax matters. This position was progressively relaxed already in the beginning of the 2000s, and this was because money launderers used to explain their source of wealth uh, with the financial institutions as stemming from tax evasion, and some financial institutions wouldn't feel obliged to report such transactions or such customers to their financial intelligence uh, units. Accordingly, FATF has amended its standard, but not by ex explicitly including tax crimes in this framework, but simply saying that uh, financial institutions would be obliged to file fin uh, or a suspicious transaction report even where a transaction is thought to include uh, tax matters. And the same or similar standard was extended also to the cooperation of financial intelligence units, saying that the request for cooperation shouldn't be refused where it is thought to concern also tax issues. Right, so this was a little extension of, to, um, of the scope to which tax crimes were considered in money laundering, anti-money laundering international standard, but in 2012, FATF has explicitly included direct and indirect tax crimes in the list of predicate offenses to money laundering. Clearly, uh, this change uh, will bring a new emphasis on the obligations that financial sector has in terms of customer due diligence, uh, transaction monitoring, and suspicious transaction reporting. The European Union, in turn, has taken the international standard and implemented it in the EU law, which has supremacy over the laws of the member states and has taken another interesting step in 2016, whereas a directive of, on administrative cooperation between tax authorities has been amended in a way that member states today, from 2018, will be obliged to provide to their tax authorities access to 
mechanisms, procedures, documents, and information that concerns customer due diligence inf um, information co uh, collected in the framework of anti-money laundering prevention, information on beneficial owners of trusts and companies, and finally also to the uh, record-keeping information that has to be stored by the financial institutions. Although this amendment has been introduced to with a goal of facilitating implementation of automatic exchange of information for tax purposes, it has been introduced as a separate, um, separate article and one can deduct that uh, depending on the actual implementation in each and single member state, tax authorities might use this provision to access information collected in anti-money laundering framework by financial institutions also for regular tax compliance matters or uh, for um, evaluating risk profiles of the uh, taxpayers. Let me briefly overview which effects the inclusion of tax crimes in the preventive uh, AML framework might have on the obligations that uh, financial institutions are facing. So financial institutions and some other obliged entities must conduct customer due diligence on each and single uh, individual or company which wants to establish a relationship, business relationship with a financial institution. The scope of information collected depends largely on the risk profile that um, financial institution attributes to a particular client by gathering information and understanding what the customer is doing. Furthermore, also the second step, the transaction monitoring, will be calibrated on the basis of risk profile that is attributed uh, to each and particular customer. Finally, uh, financial institutions, whenever they see a suspicious transaction, they have to report it to a financial intelligence unit. Um, a particular um, person concerned with the information at the center of financial intelligence units cannot be notified neither of investigation undertaken by financial institution nor uh, of the fact that information has been submitted to a financial intelligence unit. Now, if we think about the taxation which is included in the uh, preventive AML framework, it may cause a lot of uncertainty for the financial institutions because it was not really common to factor in tax risk indicators in the uh, customer due diligence or transaction uh, monitoring. So the problem areas that uh, arise in this context um, are connected with the fact that tax crimes are not actually defined on the international level. There is a general understanding of what it may mean. However, we also have a range of different practices which might constitute a simple non-compliance with the spirit of tax laws, but from the financial transactions one cannot reliably identify whether uh, a transaction has been undertaken as part of tax fraud or just aggressive tax planning practice. Law of funds in, the, in case of tax evasion is reversed than that in the case of uh, money laundering transactions. So in the context of money laundering, we have black money becoming usually white, uh, white through a range of transactions or seemingly white. Whereas in the area of tax evasion, a lot of proceeds are coming from completely legal businesses and for a range of transactions, they become proceeds of uh, tax evasion. So ta financial institutions need to start thinking in a totally uh, different direction. Thirdly, um, it has to be noted that tax crime will usually be determined as uh, committed uh, after transactions have taken place and when taxpayer submits incorrect uh, tax return or incorrect tax information to the tax authorities, which in the case of money laundering is different. The crime is committed uh, before uh, the transactions of money laundering process are undertaken. Finally, uh, jurisdictions have uh, different thresholds for the definition of serious tax crimes. And let me uh, tell you that anti-money laundering framework has been designed 
to tackle or prevent serious crimes and not just crimes which are punishable with softer penalties because, of course, implementation of money laundering framework quite exp expensive. So for global financial institutions, it will be really difficult to consider the different thresholds implemented by different states and uh, whether it applies to the particular client who might come from any angle of this world. Right, so having said this, probably it is clear that um, accumulation of tax-related information in the context of the preventive money laundering framework will uh, increase substantially. However, this may concern also cross-border exchange of information between financial intelligence units. So uh, this slide provides simply a comparison of the standards that we have in the area of taxation uh, and also the threshold that is uh, necessary to be satisfied in order to obtain information from the other country. I would like just to highlight that in the area of anti-money laundering, financial institutions, my, uh, f financial intelligence units cooperate sometimes without any agreement between themselves if uh, this is permitted by national laws. Sometimes they enter into memorandums of understanding or letters of intent, which are pure interinstitutional agreements. And this is quite different in the area of taxation because tax administrations will usually need to have a tax treaty or tax exchange of inf tax information exchange agreement in place. Another thing that I would like to highlight that also the threshold for the exchange of information is much lower in the area of uh, anti-money laundering. Effectively, presumed relevance of information for money laundering uh, prevention or investigation is sufficient. Whereas in the area of taxation, uh, the, uh, the tax administration forwarding request will usually needs to, to substantiate its request uh, for the information and provide some detailed facts in that respect. And of course disclosure uh, to the person concerned in this uh, cross-border exchange of information will depend very much on a national laws in the area of taxation, but it is in principle prohibited, prohibited and not practicable when information is exchanged between financial intelligence units. So with giving this overview, I'm coming to the uh, conclusion where I would like to highlight several areas which in my opinion provide um, concerns to the adequate protection of personal data in this exchange of information and growing interlinkages between tax and anti-money laundering frameworks. So first of all, if tax authorities are given unfettered access to the information collected for money laundering purposes, in my opinion, it seems to be uh, rather disproportionate because in the area of money laundering prevention, information is collected on each and single customer. There is no need for a, a suspicion of any offense uh, or any tax, uh, illicit tax practices. There might be too much confidentiality attached to the information which leaves money laundering framework and is provided to the tax authorities. As we know, um, and as explained earlier, the individual who is subject uh, to the information collected in money laundering framework will n usually not be uh, notified neither by authorities or financial institutions. And when this information comes uh, to the hands of uh, tax authorities, in my opinion, uh, subject persons should be notified that such information it might be used for tax investigation purposes and they should be given right to at least review and rectify this uh, information if it is not correct. Uh, there is a risk that overreporting problem by the financial institutions will, uh, will be even more accentuated and this is because it is impossible to determine uh, with a um, reliable certainty that a transaction is connected uh, to a tax crime. I saw some statistics from Jersey and apparently in 2015 30% of suspicious transaction report concerned uh, tax concerns, but very few of them were then investigated by the financial intelligence. 
And finally, um, I would like to mention the fact that, of course, there is a risk that in the future, tax authorities of some countries with a weaker rule of law might be using uh, the capacities of financial intelligence units to engage in cross-border exchange of information rather disproportionately. Uh, because the financial intelligence units can simply indicate that there is uh, a suspicion that uh, certain transactions or certain persons are concerned with uh, tax evasion. Right, so um, having said this, I would like to conclude briefly by saying that I would appreciate very much your views, your questions and your feedback on the ideas that, have, that I have expressed here and I hope we'll have um, a nice discussion and would like to give floor to the next fellow, um, panelists. Um, thank you, Marie. Um, our next um, speaker is well known to many here. Uh, Ali Nurusi is the Inspector General uh, for the for Tax Administration on uh, the Australian uh, tax system, uh, and he is going to be uh, talking about exchange of information and uh, taxpayer rights implications for that. Good morning. Um, first of all, uh, I'd also like to thank, like everyone else, uh, Nina and the IRS and also Professor Lang and uh, the U, hopefully I've got that right, <laughs> team for organizing this event. It's great for us to talk about this topic, but also it gives people like me uh, to get together with my colleagues from Mexico, South Africa, Canada, US, Sweden, and um, really, um, it's a, it's a fairly lonely job being <laughs> a, a scrutiny on a tax administration and sometimes there is um, some comfort uh, from uh, learning of each other's challenges and successes. So this is a wonderful opportunity. Um, uh, it's also lovely to be in Vienna, which is a beautiful city. It gives me a chance to practice my German, although, <laughs> uh, although I usually feel like having a lie down after I've made a German sentence. And, and this morning I've made two sentences before breakfast, so if I'm not sufficiently entertaining today, that's the problem. Um, uh, now, on topic, um, I will need glasses occasionally, I've got, uh, I've got older. Um, uh, one of the key challenges, obviously, for any tax administration is the balance between the right to privacy and the need for transparency. Um, however, I think... Um, Increasingly, we are going to see uh, more, more information being released in the public domain, whether we like it or not. Uh, and I think the key is how we use that platform positively. Um, but of course, we need to respect taxpayers' privacy. Uh, but I think increasingly, particularly in the corporate sphere, there will be a push for more and more transparency, and Australia is no exception. Some of the more recent measures that the government has introduced uh, include um, that the ATO, the Australian Taxation Office, now releases some taxpayer information of certain corporate taxpayers. There is also a voluntary tax transparency code introduced where large corporates, particularly multinationals, uh, may choose to release further information. Uh, at the small end of town, there is a new measure announced. We are waiting to see how it might be implemented with regards to disclosure of tax debt information of businesses that have not effectively engaged with the ATO. Um, now, my office has for some time, of course, advocated uh, for the right to privacy in a review that I did in 2009 with respect to settlements, this is what we said. 
uh, we've said as well as raising privacy concern, publication of settlement details would be likely to deter taxpayers from entering into settlement arrangements where it is in the interest of good administration to do so. Transparency should be achieved by publicly reporting the aggregate amounts of tax reduced from original tax office compliance raised liabilities in all categories of cases, including objection, appeals and settlements. So effectively what I said, because at the time there were some calls that perhaps the big end of town were getting better deals than the small end of town, which is not an uncommon um, uh, issue to be raised. And my point was that you can rela release aggregate data for those mar market segments uh, to achieve the same thing without the need for all, um, all settlement uh, details to become public. Now, often, and I, uh, perhaps our Swedish colleague can at some point comment, but obviously um, those that, uh, uh, that favour more transparency at the cost of privacy often cite the Scandinavian uh, model where there is significant disclosures. And I, th I think that's something we could, we could discuss. Now, moving on to um, cross-border exchange of information specifically, um, I think uh, we all recognise that uh, cr cross-border EOI, for want of a better word, um, is necessary. Um, it enhances global transparency uh, and cooperation in, in maintaining the integrity of tax systems worldwide. I think the OECD has said uh, it is no longer extraordinary for taxpayers to reside in one country, hold assets in another, and have them managed from a third location. But regardless of why taxpayers situate their assets beyond the boundaries of their own resident country, the result is that tax administration around the world face more and greater challenges to the proper enforcement of their tax laws. To meet these challenges, tax authorities must increasingly rely on international cooperation based on the implementation of international standards of transparency and effective exchange of information. I think I had uh, one uh, tax official tells me that, you know, in the past you had, for example, the large accounting firm and law firms that were internationally uh, uh, connected so they could have a global view of things. And really, tax administration are largely catching up to them by having the same level of cooperation. And of course, an earlier iteration of this was JITSIC, which some of you may be familiar with. And Australia is no exception. Uh, we engage in cross-border EOIs with foreign revenue agencies through extensive international tax treaties, conventions and information exchange agreements. There is also a range of other international tax transparency measures. I've already mentioned JITSIC. Another one for the Americans in the audience, of course, is the Australia-US intergovernmental agreement uh, to implement FACTA, which um, uh, we understand from the previous conference, not so popular in the US, at least among some. Um, <clears throat> more recent development, of course, is the country-by-country country reporting, uh, which was as a result of the um, uh, Action 13 of um, the uh, Action Plan on BEPS. And in 2015, the OECD released its final report, uh, which concluded that a standardized approach to transfer pricing is required such that revenue authorities will have relevant and reliable information to perform an efficient and robust transfer pricing risk analysis. Now, um, all of these, of, of course, like other jurisdictions, shows the Australian government's commitment or the ATO's commitment to uh, combating tax avoidance. Um, now, as I said earlier, the um, and I think Ian Young uh, in the earlier session alluded to it. We did a review in the Taxpayer Rights and Protection, I'm sorry, we've called it Taxpayer Charter and Taxpayer Protection. Uh, we are not so used to the concept of Bill of Rights as uh, uh, our American friends are. Uh, it, it, you know, we, we, we do not have the same culture of um, you know, having various Bills of Rights. So to have suddenly one for called that for tax purposes may be a bit too revolutionary at this stage. Um, uh, but in that review that um, uh, Ian alluded to, uh, one of the things we look at 
Actually, before I do that, let me digress. Um, uh, just apropos of what was discussed before in terms of um, taxpayer rights and having remedies, um, uh, Professor Bovakwa, who uh, we used quite a lot of his work and he was very generous with his time in doing our review, uh, mentioned the importance of remedies. I've questioned that in that report, in that um, the reason being that the big end of town or the larger taxpayers largely don't worry about this sort of thing. They want to take the substantive approach on and take that to court. And frankly, the little people, at least in Australia, the cost of litigation being what it is, are unlikely <laughs> to take something like this to court and champion it. Um, uh, I think even if they had the money, much like the big end of town, they would take on the substantive uh, issue to court rather than were they nice to me, were they, you know, efficient, did they... Uh, so um, we've made... Uh, uh, I'm happy to discuss it outside of this because it's off topic, uh, but uh, we have made a number of other recommendations in that regard, which it may come out during the fireside chat, I don't know, but otherwise I'm happy to uh, take it on um, separately. But of course, you know, with all of what we all say here, you've got to take it within the context of your demographic, your cultural norms and so on, and the historical evolution of our various tax system and our political uh, machinations. Um, so uh, all of that needs to be borne in mind. Anyway, now back on topic again. Um, um, one of the things that we look at in this is the cross-border exchange of information. Uh, and, you know, what happens... We, we always, in our reviews, look at what happens internationally, at least, with respect to comparable jurisdictions. Uh, and then we say, well, what is achievable in the Australian context? Well, in the report, we, we note that a 2014 report, which was published by the global British law firm Dentons, um, of the 15 jurisdictions in Europe and North America, uh, it showed that the majority did not provide taxpayers with any notification when their information is sent to a revenue agency in other jurisdictions. The exceptions were France and Kazakhstan, in addition, the survey noted that of the jurisdictions surveyed, only Germany, Spain and Switzerland notified the target taxpayer when a request for cross-border EOI had been received in relation to their affairs. On the other hand, <laughs> um, the OECD has recognised that notifying affected taxpayers uh, may be important for preventing mistakes such as identity. It may also facilitate voluntary cooperations directly between the taxpayer and the revenue agency. However, they also note some exceptions, and the exceptions they note are these. Notification rules should permit exceptions from prior notification, notably in cases in which the information request is of a very urgent nature or the notification is likely to undermine the chance of success of the investigation conducted by the requesting jurisdiction. And time-specific post-exchange notification, e.g. when such notification is likely to undermine the chance of success of the investigation conducted by the requesting jurisdiction. Uh, in keeping with international norms, the Australian tax treaties do not require uh, that the taxpayers be informed. Having said that, however, when you do information gathering in the domestic context, you're either required by law to inform the taxpayer or the ATO does it as a matter of practice, um, except in exceptional circumstances such as the ones that I just noted. Now, when we did our review, uh, we uh, uh, our recommendation was that, first of all, Whilst um, the ATO's, the Australian Taxation Officer's practices was largely in conformance with international norms, uh, however, given what they do domestically, best practice would be to extend the same domestic practice to international exchange of information so that you do notify the taxpayer at the earliest opportunity um, and that you allow them to even provide that information themselves. 
because often with information requests, the, you know, the revenue agency have a very strong appetite for information. And um, what often happens is there is so much request that sometimes the information request is not even understood correctly. That if there was effective engagement, they might be able to provide that very same information that they're requesting from the taxpayer themselves. Um, so, and also, you know, it, it fosters a better relationship. It stops the escalation of disputes if you do approach it in that kind of a, uh, in, in, that, in that kind of way. Uh, the other thing we've said is that uh, the ATO doesn't have one centralized statement of practice about what they do with information exchange. So one of the things we've said that they need to publish what their practice is and bear these issues in mind. We have also said that generally um, they should inform the taxpayers as soon as possible, but where it's prejudicial to the investigation, then at the very least they should inform the taxpayer upon the conclusion of the audit and the issue of assessment. And the reason we've said that, because at that point the ATO is able to take recovery action protected recovery actions, such as freezing orders, garnishing notices, and departure prohibition orders. Um, so in those cases, we said it could be delayed. Um, I think it's really important that revenue agents establish their practice, sorry, publish their practice, because that's how you can hold them to account. Uh, even if they're not 100% binding, at least um, if there is something there, then that's a basis for discussion. If it's not, then you know, they cannot be held into account. Um, I think the session we are also supposed to... Um, um, oh, one other subject that I should cover, and that is the challenge of using information obtained through EOI. So what happens if you obtain information as a result of uh, exchange of information, cross-border exchange of information, but that you may have overreached your, for example, treaty powers in what you have obtained? Uh, how likely are you able to use that information? We don't have any judicial decisions on point, but perhaps the most relevant is uh, Delaney versus the Commissioner of Taxation. Uh, that was to do with use of stolen Lincolnstein bank documents. And in that case, the court said that um, you know, the ATO's use of it was, uh, did not amount to conscious maladministration and did not vitiate the assessment issued. So my take on that is that the courts are likely to, uh, to come more on the side of the, on tax administration, even if the information obtained may have been an overreach. Um, now, I think the other issue we were going to concern was the impact of information exchange on individuals and small businesses. Um, Cross-border ex exchange of information affects small businesses, but perhaps another form of exchange of information is, um, uh, it probably affects them more, and that is what we call data matching, where the ATO obtains large amounts of information and then they compare it against what you've reported. So some of this could be from foreign revenue agencies, for example, if you have bank accounts elsewhere. Uh, and um, uh, we have done a review, uh, much like the one I said. All our reviews, by the way, are public and up on our website. Um, the review we did here basically said that you've got the ATO needs to make sure that the data it uses for data matching is reasonably accurate, so that compliant taxpayers do not get caught up based on inaccurate data, because some of the information obtained third parties are mandated by legislation to provide it. Other third party information are not. And they need quite a lot of what I call cleansing before they can be used. Otherwise, they, give, uh, they may end up in accurate results. Um, the other thing that they often get used for, the information from data matching, is the pre-filling of tax return. And ATO, uh, we have quite a substantial pre-filling program, which the OECD has recognized similar to Canada. Uh, and um, uh, also, it's, uh, and it says it's in line with other jurisdictions such as the Netherlands, Portugal, France, and Singapore. Um, and what, what we've said there is that whilst the ATO continues to improve the accuracy of pre-filled information, it's really important that taxpayers and tax advisors do not over-rely on it. One, because of integrity of the system, 
but also because if subsequently it's found to be incorrect, then there is extra compliance cost for the taxpayer themselves, so that you should always double check those information. Let me conclude, and as a, um, as a uh, and I won't go through everything because I think I've gone marginally over time already. Um, uh, Robert, I think, is going to talk about media. I'll just touch on it. Um, look, um, I think we need to acknowledge that the media has a very positive role to play, and as it's been pointed out already, you know, Panama Papers, Luxembourg League, Lincolnstein Affair, all of these probably, had it not been for whistleblowers and the media, they may have never come to light. And I think, you know, the media has a very positive role in that term. It also has, I think, or it can have an extremely positive role in fostering uh, or promoting voluntary compliance, uh, provided um, it's done appropriately, uh, which I'm sure Robert does because he, he comes from a tax-specific uh, 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 media. And some of my comments here are really limited to generalist media or perhaps even tabloid media, which um, sometimes can selectively report or even incorrectly report or not provide appropriate context. Um, and what that can do is, um, what we've seen, let me give it to go back to what I said earlier. Remember that I said to you that the tax office publishes a certain amount of uh, large corporates tax information. I can tell you what those are just briefly so you get an idea. It includes the total income and total tax payable for Australian public and foreign owned foreign-owned entities with income of more than 100 million or Australian-owned resident private companies with income of more than 200 million. The relevant taxpayers are identified and a general accompanying narrative is separately provided. However, it does not specifically comment on the tax affairs of any of the reported entities. Now remember, in addition to that, I told you there was also a voluntary code. Now, bear in mind that this information, because it doesn't give you the whole picture, it can, if not reported correctly, it causes a lot of mischief, which I'll come to. <laughs> um, but also, on top of that, we have this voluntary code. And um, the problem, well, the voluntary code, I think, can be wonderful, and it's developing, and many corporates are signing up for it. But some of the shortcomings that... Um, have been, some of the commentators have noted, include a lack of any relevant accounting standards. So, specifically, uh, the disclosures are intended to address the total tax impost paid. The effective tax rate disclosures within the accounting standards only focus on corporate income tax for a consolidated worldwide group. As such, each corporation adopting TTC would need to establish its own definition of effective tax rate. On top of that, anyway, there is no guidelines for how you provi provide a narrative, but you can provide a narrative. So it, it will need a particular art to put out a narrative that's correct, that paints the right picture, but it's used, if you like, it's, it's <laughs> um, how could I put it, it, it it's user-friendly for retail use, if you like, so that your average media outlet can pick it up. So it's quite a challenge for them to report it in a way, but also a challenge for the media to interpret. And, and what, I, what I've sort of kind of concluded is that um, the processing and presenting of data in both sets of these two types of disclosures are challenging for tax professionals and more so for generalist media outlets who often report them. Concerns have been raised that inaccuracies, lack of context, and selective reporting may not result in a true depiction of tax position of relevant taxpayers. Um, and I've said that the other thing is if, if the reporting is inaccurate, one is that it undermines the report itself, but it also damages the reputation of corporate taxpayers unnecessarily and also undermines the confidence in the tax system, which, uh, which um, uh, our famous professor in the back would tell you is, um, is um, uh, it, you know, it's a big factor in voluntary compliance. Um, now, I'll leave that there, and I'm sure Robert can talk much more intelligently about the role of the media. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ali. We need some help getting uh, Robert's slides up. Our next speaker is uh, Robert Goulder, 
uh, whose title uh, presently is Special Counsel at Tax Analysts. Tax Analysts, as you know, is one of the sponsors of this conference, and, and we all thank them uh, greatly for this. Um, about, I want to just make a, a slight digression. Um, about 10 or 12 years ago, I wrote a paper for tax analysts uh, called Taxpayer Privacy and Disclosure Issues Will Continue to Touch Us All, um, in which uh, I think if you go back and re read this paper, with both, with, which both Robert and I did um, in preparation for uh, this conference, um, you'll see that this is um, a movie that has been playing over and over and over and over again on late night TV. I mean, we have seen these stories before. Um, and tax analysts in particular has been a leader in this area. Just earlier this year, they ran a conference on Freedom of Information Act and transparency, um, our US Freedom of Information Act, or FOIA. Um, and in, in my article 15 years ago, I wrote, Tax Notes is a particularly appropriate form for the discussion of these issues because, as any regular reader knows, Tax Analysts has been an active participant in the policy and legal debate surrounding privacy and confidentiality issues over the years. That debate has played out in the pages of their publications, in symposium panel discussions like this one and the others they sponsor, uh, in our Congress and in the courts because Tax Analysts has been uh, not hesitated, they've been extremely aggressive, frankly, in litigating for access to information uh, from the Internal Revenue Service. There are 10, 20 cases captioned tax analysts versus IRS seeking a different kind of information under our Freedom of Information Act and various statutes. So I, I, I want to I personally congratulate Robert and tax analysts uh, for their efforts in this process, which I think exemplify the best traditions of a free press, and he's going to talk about the work of uh, media and transparency in the tax context now. Thank you. Well, the, uh, we already had a cat image, and we already had the uh, lady screaming in the shower from Psycho, so we had to go for the uh, Schoenbrunn Palace, but it seems appropriate for the venue. Uh, thanks a lot, Chris, for the kind words. That really means a lot. Uh, as everyone knows, oh, we all right? Ah, button. I like that button. There exists a healthy tension between privacy and transparency as they relate to our fiscal systems, both in the U.S. And, and every other country. This tension has been on prominent display in recent years, and I think it continues to influence how we perceive this notion of taxpayer rights. The thesis of my remarks today really is that without a free and vibrant and even an aggressive media, uh, it's going to be problematic to keep these rights. I think the media is essential to their long-term durability. And, and one could offer the same assessment regarding our civil rights generally beyond the tax context. I find it useful to think of all our rights as somewhat fragile things. Uh, I view them as occupying a, a space in the social compact between the sovereign on the one hand and the individual on the other. And I'm really not much of a philosophical person, but I do want to talk about the social compact because in essence that's sort of at the root of where uh, the taxpayer rights come from. Most people view it as a two-party relationship, the sovereign and the individual. Perhaps it's because of where I work, but I actually think there's a third party in that relationship and that is the media um, to look at what the sovereign and the individuals are doing. And I hesitate to use the term, but to call balls and strikes. Now, coming over here to, to Europe, I thought, you don't want to use the term balls and strikes because it's a baseball metaphor. Uh, and outside of America, baseball uh, doesn't have the same uh, knowledge. So instead, I would suggest that the media is a bit like the referee in a very uh, combative soccer match. We've got the yellow cards and the red cards in our pocket. And when we see a, a foul or a dive in the penalty box, we shouldn't hesitate to produce a, a yellow card and then a red card if appropriate. So, uh, and I've learned new sporting metaphors here. But um, 
when you think about these rights being in the balance of the social compact, I think to the extent that there's a gravitational tug that exerts a, a force on these rights, its predisposition seems to be to constrain our rights rather than to expand them. Uh, and thus it's the role of the media to push back and push back loudly if necessary. Yes. Uh, uh, back in Washington, D.C., where our offices are, just about every week our editors, as they're assembling the next edition of Tax Notes, uh, we run across stories involving, uh, sometimes, taxpayers who've engaged in various forms of concealment. Uh, we also encounter, a, a, a few times, some instances of tax administrations around the world, including occasionally our own, that sometimes behave in ways that are less than fully transparent. After all, secrecy is one means of sweeping certain things under the rug if uh, that's the path you've chosen. Maybe I'm naive or old-fashioned, but I like to think that there are wiser choices. Uh, for us in the tax press, we need to have guiding principles uh, in terms of how we report these things, and, and it should be straightforward. As to individuals, if you knowingly, willfully, intentionally uh, pay less tax than you owe, we can offer no sympathy. Uh, your conduct basically makes chumps out of the rest of us who faithfully comply with our fiscal obligations. So keep in mind that our systems are premised on notions of self-assessment and voluntary compliance. Uh, it's true they are occasionally backed up by withholding uh, and, and, and reporting in certain areas. But are you really going to have a system of self-assessment and voluntary compliance that works in the long run if people feel that they're continually being made uh, chumps by version of the person next door not paying their fair share. Um, yeah, most of us wouldn't have it any other way. We like self-assessment and voluntary compliance. It's certainly better than the alternatives, uh, but can such a system uh, endure if abuses are not disclosed? I think the media is a great instrument to do that. As to governments, our stance can be summed up in just a few words. There must be no secret law. We actually have little buttons that we can wear on our lapels back in the office that say no secret law. It's sort of our, our corporate mantra. Um, and in the United States, we have an absolutely wonderful thing called FOIA, F-O-I-A, the Freedom of Information Act, the law that keeps citizens in the know about what their government is doing. And thankfully, we're not alone. Last time I checked, there were about 90 countries around the world who have similar legal mechanisms, either as a result of a statutory uh, enactment or as embodied in uh, the Constitution. Uh, sometimes it's called FOIA, often it's the Open Records Doctrine, um, Access to Information. It has various names, but the concept is vital to democratic governance. It's even received recognition from the United Nations Human Rights Committee and the European Court of Human Rights. Now, in the U.S. context, FOIA is augmented by the Internal Revenue Code, specifically Code Section 6110, which requires the release of written determinations. That's a term that gets a lot of examination when we, we bring a FOIA case. What is a written determination? Basically, it's where you have some part of the IRS, like the Office of Chief Counsel, that gives any kind of tax advice or rulings in various forms, either to another unit of the IRS or directly to a taxpayer. Private letter rulings are a classic example. Uh, and as Chris noted, my organization has not been shy about availing itself of that statute over the years uh, going well back to 1972. And of course, you can't mention 6110 without also mentioning section 6103, which acts as a counterweight that tilts uh, in favor of taxpayer privacy. 6103 basically requires the tax returns and return information be kept confidential, except as otherwise permitted. Uh, an absolutely key concept, and you can explain it in, in just one sentence. And despite this apparent simplicity, I think 6103 is actually one of the more voluminous uh, sections in the entire, entire uh, Internal Revenue Code. Chris, didn't you try to add up the number of words that were in 6103 once upon a time? You did, yeah, you did a I, cut and paste? I wrote this paper yeah. 10 or 12 years ago. I, I did not count them. I ran it through the word count function on, on, uh, in Word. Good idea. And it came out to be about 19,000 words then. It's now a little bit closer to 20,000. Yes. 
And we can summarize it in one sentence. Tax returns and tax return information shall be kept confidential, except as otherwise permitted. It's that little bit about except as otherwise permitted that opens the door to the 20,000 words. Well, in tandem, these two statutes, 6110 6103, uh, provide a basic roadmap for dealing with these competing interests of uh, privacy and transparency. However, not all tax disclosures are processed in such an orderly fashion. Not all of them go through the courts. And this is where things start to get really interesting. When we think about the major tax disclosures we've seen in recent years, they did not involve FOIA at all. These episodes relied instead on whistleblowers and stolen documents, typically documents that were surreptitiously snatched from a, a prominent bank, an accounting firm, a law firm, and they made their way onto the front page of the newspaper. So here's the ethical question. Maybe you can call it an ethical question, a practical question. What do you do as a journalist when you're confronted with a potentially groundbreaking story, but its authenticity hinges on stolen material? Do you publish it or do you hold back? And I can tell you not every publisher reaches the same conclusion here. Uh, for example, uh, stolen documents are not something that we rely on at Tax Analysts. We've been publishing for about 45 years. I can't think of any time we've, we've dealt with them. Some people have knocked on our doors and pitched us a story. Uh, and when we realize where it's leading, we kind of say, thanks, uh, we'll pass on that. It doesn't mean we're not aggressive. We're extremely aggressive, even litigious at times. Just uh, ask uh, some of the folks at the IRS. Uh, but we opt for the more orderly approach represented by FOIA. But to be perfectly objective, we can't really have this serious discussion about the role of the media without mentioning whistleblowers uh, and their documents. So let's address that now. Okay, first incident I want to cover was the UBS scandal. Very instructive. We had a major banking institution. Uh, it claims to be the world's largest manager of private wealth, and it admitted to Congress that it knowingly helped account holders evade their U.S. taxes. And you might ask, well, wasn't there some sort of a legal uh, mechanism in place to prevent that from happening? There was the qualified intermediary regime. Uh, however, it turns out UBS basically ignored their obligations under the QI agreement from the get-go. They never really took it seriously. So what we were left with I may be simplifying things slightly. We were basically left with tax compliance on the honor system. That didn't work out too well. Uh, now, there was a deferred prosecution uh, agreement with the Department of Justice. The bank was forced to pay some fines. Uh, it suffered some reputational damage, which arguably turned out to be fleetingly temporary. But it was never at serious risk, I think, of forfeiting its banking license. Uh, and none of the bank executives who were involved in breaking the law went to jail, although the whistleblower did. A former employee of UBS named Bradley Birkenfeld, who oddly became sort of a celebrity, uh, he was eventually sentenced to 40 months in jail. And it must have been an interesting prosecution because uh, the prosecutors asked for 30 months, and he was handed a sentence of 40 months. And that doesn't happen all the time. So I wonder what went on in the courtroom. I would have loved to have been there. Um, but far more important than Birkenfeld's personal fate, these UBS disclosures transformed the tax profession and the financial sector as well, really, because when the dust settled, we were left with a completely new landscape for cross-border information exchange. There was a discernible paradigm shift. Uh, it seemed that on-demand information exchange, which relies on Article 26 tax treaties and TIAs, tax information exchange agreements, that had been sort of the dominant route for doing information exchange for a long, long time. And suddenly it started to look a bit shabby. Uh, how come the TIAs and the tax treaties didn't help in the case of UBS? What was going on? It seemed to be rapidly displaced, although rapidly might not be the right word, but people were looking at automatic information exchange. On-demand information exchange wasn't cutting it here. You needed something like FATCA, uh, the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, and its non-U.S. counterpart, CRS, the Common Reporting Standards. Uh, ten years ago, I would have thought that none of that was ever going to happen uh, the amount of people in the world who would just be opposed to it 
would have would have somehow fi found a, a way to to, to, to to nix it. But here we are. Uh, it's very real, and I think it's not too difficult to connect the dots and trace a direct linkage between uh, the UBS affair and these cross-border regimes. Now, you could say it proves an old adage that abuse begets reform. And what I would say as a journalist, that we must attach a suffix onto the end of that adage so that it reads, abuse begets reform, but only if the public is fully informed. Otherwise, that linkage doesn't hold. Uh, so now I'd like to do a quick little survey an impromptu quiz of the, the, the audience here, and, and uh, you, how you vote will not be revealed, so vote in complete confidence. You're all protected by 6103. I'd like to see a show of hands. How many people think FATCA and CRS have made our tax systems better? <laughs> all right, and now, how many people believe FATCA and CRS have made our situation worse? I think we have a lot of people not voting. Chris? I, I, I think there's a third, it's a bit early to tell, isn't it? Well, yes, but we I rush mean, I things. Think, I think it's, many it's people, hour including cycle. myself, did not vote because I have no idea how it's going to work out. <laughs> we'll, we'll have the uh, same question in Amsterdam next year, so you, you, you have 12 months to think about it. Uh, Oh, and by the way, do not feel too bad for Mr. Birkenfeld, the private banker who got the 40 months. Um, don't feel too bad for him. Uh, we have a law in the United States that allows qualifying whistleblowers to claim a fractional share, a tiny, small, fractional share of the revenue that they're responsible for tipping the IRS off to. And in the case of Mr. Birkenfeld, his small fractional share was reportedly in excess of $100 million. Imagine the attorney's fees. I, I, the first thought that came to my mind is, was, was that hourly or was there a contingency fee? I, I couldn't help, but uh, anyways. Uh, but not everyone is uh, so lucky as Mr. Birkenfeld. There's other whistleblowers who have been prosecuted. Uh, I've got a list of them here, just a few of the big ones. Rudolf Elmer, a former employee of Julius Baer, passed stolen bank records onto WikiLeaks uh, and was convicted of financial crimes in Switzerland. And then a gentleman named Hervé Falciani, a former employee of HBSC in Geneva. He was a central figure in the so-called Lagarde List affair. Uh, he fled Switzerland for Spain, but was arrested almost as soon as he got there on a Swiss criminal warrant. He was imprisoned there and convicted in absentia back in Switzerland. The charge against him was industrial espionage. Well, he currently got released, went to Paris, and apparently the French authorities won't extradite him. So he's not currently behind bars, but I don't think he'll be vacationing in Zermatt anytime soon. And then let's not forget uh, LuxLeaks. The principal informants there were two PwC employees, Antoine Delter and Raphael Halle. They were convicted in Luxembourg in 2016, and their appeals are still pending. In fact, the last time I checked the internet, the ruling on their uh, criminal appeal was set to be released on March 15th, just a few days from now. So sh we should learn of their long-term status very shortly. Now, if you look at these prosecutions in the aggregate, the not-so-subtle message is that many governments don't like it when you steal tax information or financial records and then publicly reveal them. And sometimes this impulse to punish uh, goes beyond just the informants. It also stretches to the media itself. The French journalist who helped break the LuxLeaks story, Edouard Perron, he was indicted along with the two informants. According to the prosecution, his journalistic endeavors rendered him a criminal accomplice. Yes. So I would be remiss if I failed to mention that prosecuting reporters for doing their jobs is nothing short of outrageous. Uh, I think that's probably what Joseph Stalin would do. So the government of Luxembourg, shame on you. You should know better. If I had a red card, there you'd be off the pitch. Uh, if we value living in a democratic society, then we must vigorously defend press freedoms. I realize you're not always going to like what you see in the headlines, uh, but larger issues are at stake. 
And then, of course, we have the Panama Papers, the crowning achievement of the ICJ, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. You know, people ask from time to time whether tax analysts uh, participated in that um, effort, and we had some brief contact with them, basically asking if we wanted to join in, and, and, we, and we passed. Because, again, it's not really our idiom. We don't really trade in stolen documents. We, if it was a FOIA case, we'd be right on it. We would be the lead litigant. We'd finance it. We'd pay for it because we strongly believe there can't be any secret law. But we passed on, on that opportunity. And you probably know the story. There was a German newspaper that received a batch of over 11 million confidential documents taken from the Panama-based law firm Mossack Fonseca. The newspaper turned it over to ICJ, which then put a team of 80 journalists on the project trying to make sense of these disclosures. And that process culminated in extensive data release the following year. And all the usual characters were there, people laundering money, uh, people funding terrorism, uh, supporting a few dictators here or there. The associates of uh, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad were implicated. In the case of the Prime Minister of Iceland, the revelations cost him his job. There were some revelations that kind of implicated members of uh, David Cameron's uh, family. They did not lead to his ouster, but Brexit took care of that. Um, now, it can be argued that the Panama Papers are a milestone in the global transparency campaign, but again, their success depends on these stolen documents. Uh, and should we tolerate the loss of privacy because the outcome is viewed as leading to socially desirable reforms. A common response that I hear from, from journalists, uh, say at ICIJ, uh, is that they acknowledge the breach of privacy. They acknowledge the privacy right, they acknowledge that it's been breached when you're dealing with stolen documents, but they rationalize it on the basis that the taxpayer in question were cheating the public fisc. Um, as if to imply that scoundrels don't deserve the same protections as the rest of us. That almost sounds a bit like you're saying the ends justify the means, which is a little worrisome, perhaps a bit of a slippery slope. Um, I'd correct me if I'm wrong, Chris. I don't think there's anything in 6103 that says under US law, your privacy rights to confidentiality are abrogated or contingent upon having clean hands. No, and in fact, in the remedy provision, there's a provision that has, to my knowledge, never actually been enforced, criminalizing republication of uh, leaked information from the IRS. I don't think it's ever been informed. I'm not sure it could be consistent with our First Amendment. But. Yeah, yeah, but it's there. And before I conclude, I wanted to reflect on what's shaping up to be the next great battleground in uh, this conflict between privacy and uh, transparency. And we have BEPS to thanks for that. So I'm talking about country by country reporting. One of the burning questions of our time in the tax policy world is whether those reports should be made public. Should they be made public with the name of the taxpayer redacted? Should they not be published at all? Um, it sounds like there's some members of the European Parliament who would like these to be made public. I can tell you that's not what the U.S. business lobby has in mind. Uh, I have my own views, which I acknowledge might not be widely shared among uh, many of my colleagues. Personally, I think it would be fantastic if these were, were published. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Um, yeah. What, what would we learn that we don't already know or strongly suspect? I think if, if this was splashed on the, you know, the, the front cover of, of, of Tax Notes, uh, lead story, uh, by country for country reporting, it would likely reveal that you would have large, profitable, multinational corporations with an abundance of sales activity in a handful of market countries, but that they were paying relatively little income in those jurisdictions. And that's because the profits were shifted legally, completely legally, to a tax haven somewhere. Well, I'm okay with disclosing that because that's our system. Now, I'm simplifying things here again, but when you have the international consensus, when you have the PE concept, when you have the arm's length standard, you get these results, okay? And, and it's sort of cherry picking to say, give us those results. And don't change arm's length, and don't change the PE concept, and keep things the way they are. We love the status quo, but then we're not going to tell you whether the geographic footprints of our uh, economic model 
matches where the taxes are being paid. I, I just think you can't take one without the other. Um, we would gladly publish these things with the taxpayer's identity redacted. The purpose is not to embarrass firms or to make life difficult for their PR departments. The objective, which I believe is a noble one, is to allow for an informed debate. Um, and this might be one of the biggest policy questions of our generation. Where should multinationals pay income tax? Doesn't it make sense to approach that inquiry with full and accurate information? Now, I acknowledge that the incidence of the corporate tax is a strange thing. You talk to any economist, and they can't even agree on who pays it. Is part of it passed on to labor in the form of reduced wages? Is part of that burden passed on to um, public consumers in the form of higher prices? Or does it all fall on the shareholders? You, you get different answers, I think, if you talk to 10 different economists. Um, so I acknowledge that. And I also acknowledge that income taxes are not consumption taxes. Nobody should confuse the two. But, you know, if BEP stands for anything, it's the idea that many stakeholders are uncomfortable with these current outcomes. And if that causes us to question the orthodoxy, uh, then so be it. That's the right uh, debate to have. We're all about questioning the orthodoxy. Well, we've covered a lot of ground, and I'd like to wrap up and circle around to uh, the theme I started with. Without an active and engaged uh, media, these matters won't be given their, their full due, and I think critical aspects of our tax systems will be vulnerable to corruptive influences. Um, privacy and transparency can coexist in a relatively harmonious balance. And if our ambition is to advance the cause of taxpayers' rights, which it must be, then I think the media helps far more than it hurts. And that's it. And we're more or less on schedule. Thank you, Bob. Um, I'm well aware that we stand between you and lunch. I, I want to remind you that you stand between us and lunch. Um, but we have about 15 minutes for questions, if people have questions. I'd like to do them one at a time as well, if you want to stand up and ask, and maybe we can just answer them as we go. Hello, everybody. First of all, I would like to thank all of you for sharing your insight with us. And um, then I have two questions. Does any one of you have numbers, how many exchange of information requests there are between the countries? Or even better, um, spontaneous exchange of information and on request. And um, the second question, or it's more, I um, hope that you can give me some insight on your thoughts again. Um, I would like to know what are your thoughts on the increasing habit of um, equating transparency, tax, tax transparency, with the exchange of information? Because clearly it's not the only way to, um, yeah, to, to increase the transparency. Thanks. Marit or Ali, do you have uh, data on the number of international exchanges of information? I'll have to take that on notice. I, I don't have it on me, I'm afraid. Um, I would say, however, that um, when we were doing the review, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but um, one of the questions was raised, well, how big an issue is this really um, in terms of how many major exchanges of information have taken place? Um, I certainly know of some. Um, but I don't have exact numbers to give you right now, but I'm happy to get back to you and email you something. Okay. Marie, did you have any data? Uh, unfortunately, I think uh, such statistics are not really available on the global level. Uh, although um, I know from previous practice that, for example, in the European Union, spontaneous exchange of information is used quite uh, frequently by the tax authorities in forwarding information to the peer member states. However, also in the case of uh, European Union, I think there is no accurate statistics available. I have some data about domestic disclosures in the U.S. The Joint Committee on Taxation of our Congress uh, reports those every year. And um, I I've often thought that if this number was widely understood, the, the argument that is ordinarily made in support of taxpayer confidentiality, which is not only is it some sort of natural right, which I, we could argue, but also that it fosters compliance is essentially a utilitarian argument. And I think if people knew how many disclosures there were last year, they might not feel so comfortable about that. Um, 
The Joint Committee staff, I looked up this just this morning, their last report was for 2015 data. It came out last year, about uh, June of 2016. And uh, they have uh, roughly 200 million taxpayers in the United States. There were 9.8 billion disclosures of information last year. 9.8 billion. Now those are all, those are authorized under those 17,000 word, I misspoke earlier, it was 17,000 back then, it's 18,000 now. Um, un under those, those authorized provisions, um, 9.4 of them were just matching, uh, computer matching. Um, a half billion of them, uh, the remainder, 200 million of those were with our states. Uh, 250 million of them were with Congress for the budget office to be able to develop data. But there's still an, an, an enormous amount of computerized information exchange now. And I don't think that the international numbers are remotely of that magnitude. My experience is that they've been fairly low. But I, I think with, with the rise of this regime and the ability to do it you know, with a click of a button, over the over the internet, I, I think that uh, that's what we have coming at us in the future. And I'm sorry, your second question. Um, I, I guess you you have a point because the exchange of information is really transparency between revenue agencies. It doesn't necessarily mean that. Um, uh, it's transparent to the public, uh, and some may <laughs> thank the lucky stars for that. Um, <laughs> however, so you're right. However, the brief uh, that we were given for the <laughs> for the session was to cover uh, exchange cross-border exchange of information. So I guess it's transparency between revenue agency as as opposed to total transparency. Yes, Jeffrey. Yeah. The question that relates to exchange of information. I always lose my voice when we talk about exchange of information. Yeah? <laughs> uh, yeah, as we move into automatic exchange, what do we mean by informing the taxpayer? Yes? Is it enough that the tax authority says these are the categories of information on which we will engage in automatic? And then perhaps in addition added with these treaty partners? Is that sufficient? So that's one question. And then picking up Bob, you know, you're quite controversial, yeah? Uh, I think the, um, I actually agree with you on the curry by curry reporting, yeah? I've never understood why was the big debate, yeah? Because, you know, if you want to have more trust in multinationals, the first thing is better reporting, better transparency, put the information in the public domain. And the companies that have done that, I don't see that there's, you know, nothing has harmfully happened to them, yeah? under the Extractive uh, Industry Transparency Initiative, they do that, yeah? yeah. So it's, to me, a debate that is, good news is it's going to finish in 2020 because I'm pretty convinced that when the OECD reviews the provisions then, it'll decide that, um, you know, this is something that has to be put in. And the last comment is on the media, yeah? Uh, you know, you're in a special position, Bob. You understand tax, yeah? The average you know, the, uh, journalist that is standing up, you know, maybe dealing with tax once every three years, the difficulty is how do you help them understand what the issues are, yeah? And you can see that on the debate on multinationals. It's very easy to say this multinational is not paying tax, this tax haven, yeah? Mm -hmm. And then to explain why that may be the case. Huh? Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, we all need to have more responsibility in actually educating the average journalist, and I don't mm -hmm. put you in that category, on how complex tax is and trying to encourage them, in fact, to make the effort to, to understand it. Yeah, uh, that's a really valuable point. I'm glad you asked that because we do spend a certain amount of time fielding questions from uh, members of the general media who don't understand what the word transfer pricing is. Or they, a few years ago, they'd heard the phrase, you know, uh, uh, Dutch sandwich, double Irish, and they're like, what is that? Yeah, they're to get the lunch, right? I guess, exactly. Uh, at lately, we were getting a lot of calls about some of the things uh, with, with the um, House GOP blueprint about the border adjustment. Lots of questions. Do the currency rates adjust? Is it a VAT? Is it not a VAT? When's it a VAT? When's, and just, it, endless questions. And uh, we, we do try. We're not always sure that it sinks in. Um, sometimes I'd spend 20 minutes on the phone with a reporter from a newspaper in the west coast of the United States trying to explain something about, say, the border adjustments. And then the next morning I would look at the paper and I would look at the article that that journalist wrote 
and he seemed to get it wrong. So if, if it's frustrating to me and I'm in the media, I can al almost imagine how frustrating it would be to policymakers, people in government, people with firms who have a narrative. They've got a message that they want to get out about why certain policies should be followed through on. And how does that narrative get out when you know you can't get the basic facts correct? So it's a real issue. I would just want to, you know, somebody I think this morning should mention this fair share of tax. The trouble is, um, I'm sure uh, it may get covered right, but I mean, you asked the question, you think it's great that, you know, what did you mention country by country report? Uh, as I said, when most people don't understand what transfer pricing is, uh, and what people fail to understand when they do, our, when we do our own individual taxes, we don't sit there and decide, how can I pay the maximum amount of tax? We certainly go there and claim every deduction to which we are legally entitled to. Now, corporations are no different. Uh, but what gets lost in the media is that they start blaming the taxpayer for making maximum use of what the legislation and the case law says. Um, and then this concept of, are they paying their fair share of tax? Well, I'm sorry, what does that even mean? Where is that defined? And this is kind of the debate we start getting into that is unhelpful. Uh, now, what I would say is that, okay, if people feel that's not right, then the lawmakers need to turn their minds to the law and amend it such that everybody feels they pay their fair share of tax. So I think there is a real difficulty. I think the transparency issue we will get more information out in the public domain, but we really need to uh, embark on a program of education that is not sensationalist to make people actually appreciate what's out there. I think you also had an earlier question, that, 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 which was about... Um, Notice an opportunity to be heard and with and yeah, what, what kind of remedy goes with yeah, that. Yeah, I, I think um, uh, there is an issue, and somebody else said about pressing of a button. Um, I guess. What I'm more concerned about in that scenario is probably more about the, uh, the, the security of the information, especially when such a large amount of data can be transferred. Now, there are stuff that OECD has said, and all of that stuff is, um, seems to make sense. And certainly the Australian Taxation Office does abide by all of those laws, because I, I don't think they share the information unless they're sure that they would have the same protection as they would under Australian law. Um, but I think before they press that button, <laughs> why do they even need to know that if they, it, why do they even need to do that if they can get the same information from the taxpayer locally? Um, and if it's not a covert audit or if there is no risk to the revenue, why shouldn't that avenue be explored in the first instance? Another question? My name is André Laroux. I'm from Canada. Uh, thank you for all your good comments. I think it was very, very helpful. And mainly for me, the, the role of the media in you know, the tax system. Uh, to me, transparency, it, it also means that for taxpayers, they have to know that the, the leaders of the government will act transparently. And when they don't, well, how can they feel that they have to pay their fair share of taxes when the leaders of the government, and I'm talking about, obviously, the U.S. I'm also talking about Canada, uh, because <laughs> twice in our history, we had one leader, one prime minister, who eventually paid his taxes through the voluntary disclosure system, <laughs> and another one who used legally obvious Barbados for his own company and people found out about it and they didn't really like it and now we have Luxembourg and you had a good article in Tax Notes International titled was, uh, was so rotten with the Grand Duché of Luxembourg with Mr. Juncker who is now the head of the European Commission who has to inquire about make the inquiry about the companies in Luxembourg while he was there you know, as mm -hmm. Prime Minister. So, you know, in order to be transparent, you have to feel confidence about, confident mm -hmm. about the system, and when you don't have confidence, it's very hard to get transparency. 
Uh, yes, I think someone in one of the earlier panels used the term uh, a crisis of integrity. Was that the term we heard before in the first panel? But that's why it comes to trust. If, if the people running the system can't be trusted, why, why should you trust? And um, we, well, we could talk about lunch or I could talk about the President of the United States. We could, uh, <laughs> this makes lunch sound pretty good? No. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it comes about the time. Uh, we, we've spilled a lot of ink on the whole uh, non-disclosure of his tax returns and that he's never going to and that he never will. Uh, and we don't deal in stolen documents, as I just told you. So if you happen to have somehow stumbled onto uh, his tax returns, we can't really help you. But I'm sure the New York Times or somebody can. Actually, uh, the New York Times said this morning that they would be happy to go to jail to publish that. <laughs> so make sure it's them, not you. We got one, mm -hmm. one more question. Anybody over here? All right. Anybody over here? Oh, yes, a question, a question here. What? Oh, there. Where? In back there? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the presentation. Uh, my name is uh, Luca Cerioni, lecturer in tax law. I have a point in relation to the last aspect, uh, trust and confidence in the person who runs the system. I wonder whether, uh, in taking global perspective on taxpayers' rights, uh, one has to, to take a benchmark. In other words, uh, uh, behind the very best rights, is it possible that there are uh, different uh, expectations about uh, on different taxpayers' expectations about a different level of fairness in different jurisdictions according to the degree of trust and confidence that they have in those who run the system. Because if you take a global perspective, either you take a comparative perspective, you just compare, or I believe one has to choose a benchmark, a benchmark to be used for a global comparison, uh, to ask whether different jurisdictions can converge toward a given benchmark. I believe this question has not been fully addressed but uh, it can be an important question. I, I give an example. Uh, just before it was, said, it was asked whether uh, CSR makes the system better, common reporting standards, does it make the system better? Well, in my view, it can simplify possibly the tax system. Uh, if tax authorities are going to receive uh, information about foreign income automatically, well, maybe, they could, uh, maybe national legislators could exempt taxpayers from reporting for an income because they're going to receive anyway. And, uh, but uh, there is uh, a missing point in my view. Has any inquiry been conducted about the perception of taxpayers in different jurisdictions about what is uh, the level of fairness that they expect behind the very best rights? I believe in developing uh, these global perspectives about uh, different taxpayers' rights, uh, the question about the benchmark for fairness uh, has to be addressed behind making a comparative perspective. Thank you very much. And would like to hear an opinion. Thanks. Look, we, we, in Australia, we do do benchmarking. We've done a review, into bench, but usually it's done with small businesses. So, for example, you would say, you have so many cafes in a particular jurisdiction, you would expect them to report this amount of income and you would claim this number of deduction. It's much harder to do with multinationals because of the uh, complexity of what they do and, um, and also a fairness benchmark. It, you know, it's such a subjective thing in, in whose eyes. Um, uh, I, I think it's a, it's a good idea, but um, without having thought too much about it, I would have thought it's easier with small businesses rather complex structures of a multinational. It's not easy even with small businesses. In the 1990s, we had an experience with trying to uh, estimate, based on those sort of benchmarks, what kind of tips a waiter in various types of establishments should have. And it caused a great uproar. And ultimately, at least in part, Congress prohibited it, which is, goes somewhat to your point, uh, Ali, earlier, that whenever these abuses are discovered, they blame the tax administration for them rather than the people who wrote the laws. And at least in the United States, Congress is extremely adept at not realizing who wrote that law, you know? And um, they, they won't take responsibility for it. But I, I do think it's a valuable exercise to, to try and be testing your, your system all the time. And I do think the, the media plays, plays a role in, in, in that. 
Um, I think we're about out of time. I want to remind everyone that lunch is prepared uh, across the way at the university restaurant Mensa in the building, uh, next door actually. Um, please don't forget your coupon at the back of your name tag. There were two coupons, <laughs> one for today and one for tomorrow. Um, the menu is available in the conference bag and uh, you can leave your uh, things here, although the room is not attended, so you might want to take your valuables with you. Thank you to my panelists. Thank you so much.